We can't hear anything. Will not be able to hear. <laughs> you should be able to hear me now. Yay. All right. Okay, as I just said, my name is Trevor Hilton. I am a extension agent with Florida A&M, but I'm based in the Leon County Extension Office on Paul Russell Road. And um, my area of concentration is food crops, and that's vegetable and fruit, nuts, those kinds of stuff. So today we're going to look at some fruit trees that will do well for our area here in Florida. And um, I'm sure there might be some master gardeners in the audience and you must have heard this one before, plant the right, right tree in the right place. And uh, there are several factors you need to consider. Several factors to consider uh, when planting. Because you're, you're going to need a lot of sunlight to grow uh, fruit, fruit trees. And you need to have the proper space. Most of the fruit trees that we will be looking at would require somewhere around 20 feet between, between plants. You turn the speaker on the computer down then. All the way down. So as part of having the right plant in the right place, you need to consider access to water because when you plant trees, you will need to water them in the early stages. You might also wanna consider doing a soil test to make sure that the, the soil you're gonna be planting in will be suitable for, for that particular type of uh, fruit tree. So in choosing the right tree, there are some factors that you need to consider is, I would say things like pests and disease, disease factors and um, how much work is gonna be involved and how much time are you willing to give to, to, to this, this tree or these trees that you will be. And to a certain extent, the harvest time also should be considered because um, if, if you're in um, areas where it uh, freezes over, then you don't want to have crops that are gonna be harvesting late in winter where you might have problems with a freeze um, and losing that crop. So let's look at some of the low maintenance trees. For those who want uh, trees, fruit trees that is very low maintenance, it's basically just uh, watering whenever there is drought and um, light pruning every now and again. We've First one we'll start with is citrus. And there are many types of citrus there. You, you know, we, we're not limited just to satsumas here in our area. We, we have lots of sweet oranges, grapefruit, mandarins, acid fruits, lemons, limes. And then of course they have the other the ones they call the oddballs like Buddha's hand and such like. So, So in selecting a site to plant trees, sometimes you don't have much of a choice because it's what is what you have. I remember when I was planting my trees, my I, 
as much as I would have wanted to plant in full sun, I, I just wasn't afforded that privilege because my neighbor's trees were shading. So sometimes you have to do the best, but go for full sun because you would, you would probably get better production when you have your trees in, in, in more sunlight. 20 feet apart is probably about the common spacing for most of the fruit trees that you, you, you would be planting. I have some at the office that I've planted uh, 15 feet apart because I was, uh, I would say, we were very low on space and I wanted to get in as many um, trees as possible. And, um, I realize if I manage, manage them um, a little differently, I could still have them producing well enough, even with the, 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 the smaller space. It means I would have to prune probably a little bit more frequently. So also look for well-drained soil so that you don't have any bogging. Um, for those, of you who might not be familiar, there's um, this crop, this fruit called pawpaw. And it does very well in low light. It also does well in moist areas. As a matter of fact, they have found it growing on riverbanks. And um, it is not very picky. It will survive just about any condition. And, uh, um, <clears throat> They typically grow to about 20 feet by about 15 long time. One of the things though is that you must have a pollinizer. So you can't just plant one. They're gonna need a pollinizer nearby and you need to plant them as close as possible. The other thing that I've observed about these trees is that they take a very long time from the time you plant to when you get the first crop. So if you are an impatient um, gardener, this might not be the tree for you. And uh, I know long is relative, but I'm talking maybe it could be um, upwards of five years before you see the first fruit. Other low maintenance trees, um, I would say are persimmons. They don't have a lot of pest problems and they will thrive even in partial light or full sunlight. And they tend to adapt to even salty conditions. So if you're living near the coast, you could consider planting these. They, they don't have a lot of insect problems. The, one of the common ones that I've seen is um, the, the, the webworm that comes on towards the end of um, summer. There are basically two types of um, persimmon. There's an astringent variety and a non-astringent variety. And um, for the astringent variety, it has to be ripened fully before you, you, you can eat it. Whereas in the non-astringent varieties, you know, tends to be a little bit hard, somewhat similar to an apple. They, these trees um, have a relatively long lifespan also. They can live upwards of 50 years very well. The other low maintenance um, tree I will mention is figs. And um, they survive in even in shade and um, they can get very big. They could get up to, um, 20 feet tall if, they, if they're allowed to, but with pruning, you can keep them under control. Figs are very cold hardy, but in the early stages, you will have to make sure that you protect them if there is a hard freeze. So those first two, three years after planting, if they're out in the open and they're not protected, they, you can have some serious um, winter, winter damage because they're one of the trees that start um, growing out probably first 
and um, they will expose themselves, you know, those young shoots to getting frost, frost damage. So make sure you cover these up when you plant them in the first couple of years. And then after that, even if they get a little bit of winter damage, they will be okay. They will bounce right back. The next one is a mulberry. And there are many different varieties of mulberry. There are some that are dwarfed and there are some that's tall. They prefer to grow in full sun, but they can still grow in partial um, sunlight. They, they can grow very fast. This tree that you're looking at here, I prune this back every year and we probably get in excess of 10 to 12 feet of tree. So they grow rapidly. Uh, so if you have a small space and you don't have time to prune them, then you know it might not be the best, best tree. You probably might also want to avoid planting them near sidewalks or driveways and those kind of stuff because um, they attract a lot of birds and with birds come a lot of droppings. And on top of that, a lot of the fruit is gonna fall and it can become very messy. Mulberries taste like? What are they for? Um, mulberries, um, what I've seen here, they can be eaten as fresh fruit, and um, but a lot of folks use them in preserves and jams, jellies. Uh, they're even used to make wines and other um, liqueurs. So that's probably the commonest use is probably jams, jellies. <laughs> If you um, want to consider olives are, they will thrive in our area. Um, they should do very well. And um, they would need a little bit of winter dormancy in order to um, produce fruit. But I can tell you one thing that I have um, learned from my mistake is that they don't do well on the shade. So if you're gonna plant olives, you need to get them in full sun. It's possible that you could get them to fruit, but it's probably gonna take a long time. I planted three trees in um, three different locations. And the first tree, which is probably over eight years old, has not produced the first fruit. And the others, which were like three, two, three, four years, they started fruiting. So they do require full sun. They can tolerate cold temperatures, so it wouldn't be a problem for our um, winters here in North Florida. Then when we look at our medium, what we call our medium maintenance trees, we're talking those that just require some watering, a little bit of pruning sometimes and thinning. And These would include like pears and they require full sunlight. They don't do well on the shade and um, they prefer slightly acidic soil that is well drained. One of the things you'll have to do is you'll have to prune quite a bit with um, pears because they have a natural tendency to want to grow straight up. And that way it reduces the amount of light going into the canopy of the, the tree and also the amount of air circulation. So you're going to have to prune. You have the, also the option of um, in the early stages, you could actually like put a weight on the branches to spread them out instead of you know having to prune them and that way you could get them to spread out a little bit better this um, tree we did that we tied some bricks on the branches and pulled them down and it seemed to work real good that way so if you're not planting on a large scale that's an option 
they I would not consider them to be trees that live very long, you know, somewhere between 30 to 40 years. They do have some disease problems. Fire blight is very, very common. Com um, twigs starting to turn black and the leaves turning black. So yes, those that that can be a problem with um, with with pears. So the European pears are the ones that are probably most susceptible to fire blights. The Asian pears are a little bit more resistant. So you might wanna consider those. They, those tend to be more hard, hard flesh pears as compared to the European pears, which are soft. So the, the European pears will, will continue. And whereas the Asian pears don't ripen once they're harvested. You have to make sure you keep the center of the, 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 the canopy open. So you would probably have to do a little bit of pruning there to keep, keep those branches from growing up and clustering and allow for good airflow. I have plums on here as a medium maintenance tree, but I, my experience with plums are, is that plums are not very easy. They require full sun. Some do require um, pollinizer. They don't live very long. And of course they're susceptible to the plum coculio, that insect that bites into the, the, the fruit and cause that what we tend to refer to as the as a worm in the fruit. You will see it in, in, in not just in plums, but it's in, pe you can find it in peaches, apples, pears also. And, um, but they, they seem to prefer your plums and your peaches, and you're gonna have to spray for those very early. You're gonna have to spray if, you, if you're gonna control that insect. And of course, around here, if you don't control that insect, then you, you could pretty much say you're probably not gonna have any, any crop. You will also need to clean up the fallen fruits because this is where that um, insect tend to overwinter. Uh, and um, the next generation starts after those they emerge from those fallen fruits. So you, you're gonna have to clean up any fallen fruits. Apples, not one of my favorites for our area. They require full sun. They can tolerate a lot of different soils, yes. And, um, but they, what we've found is that they are they are very needy. They have insect problems and um, disease problems. They they have to have a certain number of chill hours in okay. order to. I mean, different varieties have different number of chill hours. The University of Florida will require less chill hours. So if you're buying apple um, trees to plant here, be very careful, you know, not to do too many mail order because um, you might be purchasing trees that require much, much more chill hours than we, we get here in North Florida. Could you list some of the common ones for here? Any any time you see ver or Florida in the name, more, more than likely those were developed by the University of Florida, and they probably require somewhere between four hundred and fifty to six hundred chill hours. When you start going over that, your um, we might have a problem. Like last year. For example, we didn't get nowhere near that many um, chill hours. There are a couple of varieties uh, that do well here that were developed in uh, Israel. One of them is Golden Dorset, uh, and the other is Anna. Anna, Anna is a pretty good one. 
and joy. And um, I'm trying to think of some of the others that we have planted. But like I said, they, 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 they tend to be a little bit needy. They're gonna need some pruning. They need to be fertilized quite a bit also. And um, they have to get that right number of chill hours. Peaches are, um, you know, pretty high maintenance because they have to be pruned because you, your, your fruits is um, produced on the last year's growth. So you have to constantly prune in these trees and they can, they could get up to, you know, somewhere up to 25 feet if you allow them, but you would need to prune to keep these trees low enough. If um, you look at the picture, I know if you could tell, you know, because, but that tree, when I planted it, I cut it back to my knee, my knee level so that it started branching there. So I don't get a big tree. Hence, I was able to, you know, keep things under control. My basic philosophy is that you should be able to stand on the ground and harvest your fruit. Because if you don't, if you can't, if you have to go get a ladder or a picker or something, more than likely the squirrels and the other wildlife are probably going to get to it before you. Um, <clears throat> so I was saying you need to make sure that you take off the the old wood and um, you, you have to keep it pruned and um, they, they don't have that big of, you know, lifespan. They will live probably about 15 years. They have some other issues like, you know, gomosis and other um, disease problems that they, they, they encounter. But the thing about them is that they grow real fast and they start producing early. So if you have to replace them, then, you know, it, they, they, it works out real well. We could also consider um, pomegranate. Um, uh, if you want to include this in your landscape, this is a pretty good tree to include in your landscape because they leaf out very early in spring. They produce a beautiful flower and um, yes, you can get a fruit from it. But uh, my experience with, with pomegranate here is that they, they abort a lot of their, the, the fruits. that start out and set maybe a dozen fruit and you probably end up with one or two. And they do take a long time before they start producing. But there are um, beautiful trees that would fit well in your landscape. You will still have to do a little bit of pruning because the branches tend to cross a lot. Here's pineapple guava also, which is an, uh, an evergreen. It's not exactly like the tropical guava, but um, it can be used in some ways similar to the tropical guava. Makes good jams, jellies, that kinds of stuff. But as far as a fresh fruit, it's not one of the best guava that you will have. The good thing about this, this shrub is that stays green all year and it does produce a, a beautiful flower. Uh, uh, some nurseries actually sell it as a hedge as opposed to a, a, a fruit a fruit tree. So it does double duty and um, don't and don't seem to have much visits from the wildlife coming in to eat the fruit. So it's it's a pretty good, easy growing um, tree, shrub. If you wanna consider chestnuts also as a, a good option, but again, chestnuts do not like to be grown um, in shade. Found that out after I planted mine under the pecan tree. So, um, they would require a little bit of pruning 
they don't have a lot of pests and disease problems. So they're relatively easy to grow, but you would realize that it would probably take quite a few trees maybe to make you happy getting a good crop of um, chestnuts. I've included loquat also because um, even though these tend to grow almost We had a tree growing at the office that was probably in excess of 20 feet. Yeah. And um, uh, this tree that I have here in the orchard, uh, it's probably no taller than about um, 10, 10 feet. Because I made sure as soon as it got up to about say six to eight feet, I, I, I took out that terminal um, growth and I keep pruning it back and keeping it under control. That has not affected the, the production that, that, that much because these are just heavy producing trees. They will produce so much fruit that sometimes the branches will break. Explain what the terminal is for those who are familiar. For, I, I mean, the, the, when, you, when you buy a tree and it's just growing straight up, and you have one main shoot going up. If you allow that to keep going, it's gonna continue doing that. Yes, it will branch, but it will continue growing up, 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 up. Because this is a do. So if you take that out, it forces it to branch. There is a, a fancy term that they use where they talk about apical dominance. So you you, you cut the, the, the apical growth off and then the auxin, which is the, the hormone that causes branches falls lower down and, and it branches there. Um, <clears throat> when you're purchasing trees, you need to consider, you know, there are a few things, you look at the tree real good, make sure that the trunk is straight, it looks strong, the bark is smooth, there are not many pruning scars, you know, and the top is not cut off. And if you look at the root flare and the graph union, make sure that the graph union is not buried below ground. Then for the branches, Check the bark also, make sure that there are no tears and um, you know, the branches are even, evenly distributed. You, you're not always gonna find trees that look like that, but as much as possible, don't, don't get trees where all the branches are on one side of the, of the tree. You know, try and get them where they're spaced out and where, if possible, you know, at a good angle, somewhere between 40 to 60 degrees. And, um, Ideally, you should have at least um, um, two thirds of the tree with, 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 with branches. Look at the leaves also and make sure there are lots of leaves and also the color of the leaves matches with the season that we're in. So if it's fall and the leaves are yellow, that's fine. But if it's spring and the leaves are yellow, then we might have a problem, okay? Um, and make sure that you the, 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 the tree. As for the roots, if you can see the roots, make sure you know that they are whitish or yellowish, not black and dried out. And, and, and by all means, make sure they are not girdling around the pot. And um, if you start having any you know, mal order coming from the root ball, then you know you have a problem. It might not be a good tree to purchase. It's time to plant. Um, there was a time when folks used to plant um, a lot of bare root trees. I don't think we do a lot of bare root anymore. We do some here in we January. Do? Okay. Some root in January. Okay, so. Uh, so um, Audrey is saying that um, Esposito does some bare root in January, but if you're planting potted, potted trees, it doesn't matter too much when you plant them. You can plant them just about any time of the year. 
I would only caution that if you're planting in, in winter, don't do it in the in the coldest, coldest part of winter because um you probably if and especially if you put a tree out in the open, you could put it in shock. And the thing to remember is that no matter how cold hard your tree is, when they're young, they can be very tender. If you're planting in summer, it might not be the best option to plant when you know we are running temperatures in excess of 100. That might not be the best time. But you could still plant in summer, um, but you have to remember you would have to water more frequently. You, 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 you would probably have to water um, every other day. You're not gonna give a lot of water, but you would, you, you would have to increase the frequency of your watering. Some folks um, says, well, we plant in the winter so that the, the, you know, especially for deciduous trees, you know, like your peaches, your plums, your nectarines, they plant in winter so that they get established and be ready to, to come out and start leafing out in, in spring. Others say we plant, the roots get established and they're ready to you know, go through a, 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 a hard winter. Either way would work, <coughs> excuse me. So, <coughs> I think we mentioned that. Now, um, if you're planting a tree, the, the guidelines from the University of Florida is that you should dig the hole about three times the width of the root, root ball. And um, then you put the root ball in and you, you leave about 10% of the root ball above the surface of the soil. So you don't want to be putting any soil on top of the root ball. Hope we make that clear. And you also don't want to be mulching on top of the root ball. We also tell people, uh, and tell me Trevor if you agree with this, uh, to plant it slightly above grade, maybe half an inch mm -hmm. to three quarters of an inch right. because it's going to settle. Yes, yes, that is perfectly fine. Um, I remember there was an agent that used to be at the Leon County office and he was telling me a story about one time when they had a lot of trees and they were just sitting around in the pots, they sat around for a few years. And before you know it, they started growing through the, the holes in the pots and started growing, becoming established. And lo and behold, they turned out to be a lot better than the ones that they had planted. They grew much faster because there was probably, you know, quite a bit that was exposed above the ground and there was probably uh, um, you know, more air going to it. Because we need to remember, you know, um, uh, uh, plants take up oxygen through their roots. Back to mulching. If you do mulch, if you notice the picture on your left, my left, the, 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 the mulch is not on the root ball. So you mulch around the trees. There are lots of different schools of thoughts about mulching um, fruit trees. Some folks prefer not to mulch and especially like citrus, they would say, oh, you shouldn't mulch citrus. If you look at the literature from California, they, they suggest mulching. Whereas a lot of Florida says no mulching. I'm, I tell you this, I mulch, our trees at the office. But the reason I mulch is not for moisture control is because we have an outside surface. And if there is not mulch around there and there are weeds up against the tree, then the string trimmer is gonna start hitting those trees. So I, I mulch to protect the trees from the string trimmer. 
don't mulch like the tree on the right that looks like a volcano because you do that then you um you are encouraging a lot of different critters. I mean, there are field mice and others that will come in and start living in there. And before you know it, they will actually probably start feeding on the bark uh, of the tree and can actually kill that tree. So that is definitely a no-no. And yes, I drive around town and I see a few of those every now and again, but we are still trying to educate people not to do that. You're only going to stake if you need it. It's not to say that as soon as you plant, you should go ahead and stake. If the tree doesn't need staking, then don't stake it. And the other thing is that as soon as a tree becomes established, it, it, the tree would be better able to, to develop stronger roots if it's allowed um, the wind to blow the tree, it would develop much stronger roots that way. Um, trees that are growing, say, on a, the side of a cliff near the, the ocean, where there's always a lot of wind, they have some of the strongest, strongest roots because it's just natural for, for them to do that. As a matter of fact, some of the big commercial nurseries, when they're doing like seedlings, they would blow a fan over the, the seedlings and that helped them to develop, help those seedlings to develop good roots. So having wind movement will definitely help you to develop roots. If you plant, remember we said earlier, you must consider your water source. You're gonna need to have some irrigation if you're, if you're planting fruit trees because it takes a little while for them to become established and I use the term established meaning this is a time when they can live on their own um, without you know necessarily having to have an irrigation source they could just basically depend on rain and occasionally if there is a prolonged period of drought then you might have to water but it in the in the early stage in the first year or so you might have you you know they're not fully established the roots have not left the root ball and start going out as yet so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to irrigate fertilizing um there are lots of different um blends of fertilizers that are on the, on the market right now if you want to just use a general purpose fertilizer, six or a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, my recommendation is that you should use one pound for each inch in diameter of the trunk of the tree. So let's just say you have a, a, a tree that is two inches in diameter, you're gonna use, you're gonna um, fertilize using two pounds of fertilizer and that is for the year. So you could split that two pounds in maybe two or three applications. Some folks say use one pound for every year the tree is, which comes back to about the same as one pound per inch in diameter. If you, if you use the specialized fertilizer, like the ones that are specifically blended for say citrus, citrus tone is one of those. If you use that, follow the directions on the, on the back. Complete different fertilizer. Um, it's you know, probably slow release and you're gonna use a lot less than your general purpose fertilizer. So the, the, the information I'm giving you here is for a general purpose fertilizer. Using the diameter is also good when you don't know how old the tree is. Right. If you bought property that has fruit trees on it and you don't know when they were planted, you st it's still gonna work out the same, but it's a lot safer to go with the diameter. Right, right, absolutely. So we are gonna touch on pruning. I think we are right okay. on. One of the best, best 
reason to keep your trees small is, you know, they're harder to care for when they're when they're big. You know, look at a, a, a pecan tree that is say 50, 60 feet tall. And you're a homeowner and you have some pecan scab. And you're, you know, you ask me, well, what do I do with this? And I said, well, you're gonna have to spray. And your question is, how am I gonna get the spray up there? So big trees are much, much harder to, 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 to maintain than small trees. So that's a good reason to prune your trees. And I think I mentioned this earlier, if the tree gets too big, the squirrels, the birds, and the other critters are gonna be the ones harvesting the fruit and not you. You need to keep in mind that there are some trees that can put on a lot of growth in one season. I have seen some um, persimmons and some, um, even some peaches. And I think I'd mentioned the mulberry earlier. They can put put out um, eight to 10 feet of growth in, in just one season. So you have to keep these in check or if not, they will get out of control. I, most people think that, oh, pruning is a science. But I tell you this, if you get two, if you get two trees and get two master pruners and they prune, you are gonna see some completely different, you know? So it's, it's, it's all about how you see it. So when you prune, it's especially for your deciduous trees, your pears, your plum, your peaches, um, it's best to do these during the winter months. I usually aim for somewhere around Valentine's Day. And, um, that way there are no leaves. You can look at the tree, you can see if there are any crossing branches, anything that's dead. Um, you, you're much able to see what's going on so you can cut, do your cut back that way than when the tree has a lot of leaves on it, you, don't, you can't see real well. well. And um, like I say, if you are not absolutely sure, just, take some of it off. If you have to err on pruning too early or too late, you don't want to prune too early. Because if you do that, um, let's just say you go up now and start pruning your, your, your um, persimmons or your peach trees, what it's gonna do, is gonna stimulate the trees to put out new growth. You put, put that out and then we have uh, a real cold spell in December, January and all that new growth gets completely destroyed. That is gonna set that tree back so badly. So if you have to prune a little later, don't prune too early. And do not apply any fertilizer after, you know, um, initial, I mean, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, that is, after heavy initial pruning. There are some pruning that you can do throughout the year. So I'm not saying that you should wait until the end of the year to do. So, um, like you have water sprouts that are coming up, like the one you see in the picture there, you could take those off because those are not gonna be your productive branches. Take those off when you see them. So when you prune, remember the three, these dead branches, diseased branches are damaged branches. So if branches are crossing where they're rubbing and damaging each other, you definitely need to um, take out one of those crossing branches. If you have a citrus and you see this kind of growth coming out, any time at all you see this, 
you 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 see the 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 these spouts coming up below the graph union. Anytime you see them, take them up. And here's where I'd say, don't use um, uh, uh, clippers to clip these. Break them off with your hand. They will snap right out. And they tend to heal a lot better when you do that. Because when you, when you take your pruners and you cut that off, you're gonna leave probably a, a, a node or so um, right there and grow right back. So just you know, reach down and break them up. Remember though that um, that what you're 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 seeing there is the rootstock. So chances are those branches are going to be very thorny. So be very careful. But you know, don't let them get too big to the point where you have to use because if they do, you will have to use the clippers to get them off. So just break them off and. Um, it would be just fine. Yes, you could do that. You know, like if they if they get so, you know, up too tall and they're now tangling with other stuff, just cut them off and then break them out. And um, when you prune, you make flush cuts. You want to cut right back to the, to, to the branch, to the limb from which it's growing. Um, I think there was a time they used to say you, you leave a color or in some pruning, um, maybe some of your, for your fruit trees, I'm gonna tell you cut right back, make a flush cut. You should also remove any branches that are growing downwards. Um, they're not going to be your most productive branches. And this goes for, I mean, across the board, just for about, about for any, any tree at all. If the branches are growing down, it's, then before long, you're not going to be able to get on the, uh, up to the root of the, the, the tree to do any maintenance. So you need to cut branches that are growing downwards. Any branches that are crossing and um, are you know rubbing on each other you need to take one of those out you should also thin out so that you know you have enough air space around each branches uh, i think one of the basic rule of thumb they say a bird should be able to fly right through the tree unimpeded and um once you do those prune um pruning cuts then if you have branches that are growing too tall the tree is now getting up to eight ten feet and you figure that that's going to be too tall for you you start taking off some of the top of that tree and um keeping it more in in control and at the height which you you desire sometimes you might have to do a little bit more radical pruning if you allow the tree to get out of control and when you do that you you you'll find that um your production for the following year would suffer, but you have to make that decision. Do I cut it back now, keep it under control and don't get as much, or do I just keep going? So. We have a number of questions. I will stop here and now we will take the questions. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question about my yard first. My golf, my golf rose plum tree is blooming because of the weird weather. What can I do? Because last year it bloomed in December and then we had a cold snap and I got two plums off of it. Do you have any recommendations? It's not, I mean, uh, from what I've seen in my visits, most plum trees didn't do anything last year. And again, because we didn't have enough um, cool, cool weather. So there's not a whole lot you're gonna be able to do, do when the, the, the reason is because it's not enough chill hours. Okay, I'll read the question. I'm gonna go back. Uh, do, you need to do you need to do anything about the webworm problem for okay. persimmons? Okay. Marion says she tries to break off the affected branches. Does that All right. help? The, 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 
I, I said this one time, sometimes the best thing to do is do nothing. But I, I think it is. Um, I have seen people do strange things that they would get some incinerant and tie it to a stick and try to burn it off. That's one of the worst thing you could ever, ever do. Um, usually when you see those web worms, they have done whatever damage they're gonna do. And they're just right there in that little area. Even if you spray, the spray is not gonna get to them anyway. And um, if, you, if you do feel the desire to cut them off, yeah, if it's just a small twig, that's, that's fine, that's fine also. But they're gonna become food for the birds real soon. Evelyn wants to know why her satsuma tree produces only four or five oranges that are super sour and inedible. Do you think it froze back to the rootstock? I would, I would probably, I would probably guess that that's what happened. Is that you? If they're super, super sour, then you're probably um, uh, have a sour orange. If the is the tree, if the tree is thorny, there are lots of thorns. You, I, I mean, I would go ahead, go out on a limb and say what you have is a rootstock. Most citrus is grafted onto sour orange rootstock. So uh, you either have a sour orange tree or it got killed back below the graft and it's growing from the rootstock. It's not necessarily to say um, on sour orange. They also use lemons because lemons tend to be very, very cold, cold hardy. And there is the trifoliata, which is another one. So if you notice the leaves that are, are coming up and they have three lobes on them, that tells you that's not your, your grafted citrus. That's your rootstock when you see those three leaves. And um, I think they even have a new rootstock that they're using now, uh, flying, uh, flying dragon, which is supposed to be more dwarf and it would give you a, a, a smaller tree. So there, there are lots of different rootstocks that are used. She also wants to know why her Meyer lemon only fruits on the lower half and there's no fruit on the top half of the tree. Maybe, maybe what happened, you remember those um, water sprouts that we were talking about earlier. If you get those start growing up and my lemons are famous for that. They would send those shoots straight up and uh, those are not gonna be productive for a long time. It might take years before they start producing. So that might've been what's happening. And this is why I was saying, take those off and allow the productive branches to, to, to produce. So if you have those growing up, then chances are it's gonna take a while before they, they will eventually produce, but it's gonna take a while. Okay, I tried to take, remove those, but I, I use clippers. Yes. Yes. So yes, you, 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 if you want to, you, you know, you might just want to go ahead and prune off the top of those um, that and keep the tree uh, uh, at a man manageable height. And um, pretty soon you will start getting some fruit coming up, coming from, from those branches. All right, thank you. Is there any type of generic prep that you need to do for citrus before winter? The only thing you need to do um, to prep for citrus before winter, if the tree, if it's a young tree, and I'm talking a couple of years old, and we're gonna have a real hard freeze, we're going into the 20s, you want to cover that tree. And I'm talking about using a blanket, a piece of plastic is not gonna work. And it has to be draped all the way to the ground one of the worst things that you can do is thinking that you can just wrap the, 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 the foliage of the, the tree in a blanket and tie it around the, the trunk of the tree. I mean, now you get something that looks like a lollipop. That's one of the worst things you can do because now the trunk is exposed to all that cold. So you need the, the, the whatever you're using to drape 
and it must go all the way to the ground. So you can trap that heat inside. So that's one of the prep if the tree is young. If you have fruits on the tree and it's gonna be a real hard freeze, it might not be a bad idea to take them off. But if, if, you're, if we're not necessarily having a freeze, even if you have ripe fruit and assuming you don't have many visitors coming in, at, then you, you, you'll be better served leaving the, the fruits on the tree. They would last much longer than they would last on your kitchen counter. One of the things that a friend of mine does is the old fashioned Christmas tree lights, the incandescent, wrap them around the branches of the tree if there's fruit on it to keep it, because they do generate heat, unlike the newer LEDs. What do you think of that? And then wrap it to the ground. I, yes, I've seen, I've seen that um, also. I've seen some folks who do that, but like I say, it's a, it's a lot of work. So, you know, but use, use a very thick blanket. Use something that's, you know, that's going to provide some cold protection. Just, you know, make sure you do that. Uh, Gerilyn asked, when is the best time to prune full grown bearing lemon trees? You're only going to prune your lemon trees if they're growing out of, if they're getting too big, they're getting too tall for you. If you think that they're, they're, they're taller than what you desire, then you would probably prune. You will probably prune um, if there are any dead branches on there or any diseased branches, you will take those off, yes. If you have branches that are growing downwards or touching the ground or crossing branches, that's the only time. But if you don't have any of those issues, there's no need. Um, lemons are not like, um, say uh, nectarines or peaches that have to be pruned in order um, to, to produce. Mary has a fruit cocktail tree that is a grafted plum, nectarine, and peach, and it has not produced any fruit. She's had it eight years, and the leaves come every year, but no fruit. What should she do? I, I'm not a big fan of the fruit cocktail. My, my, um, because sometimes you get too many different types, uh, um, too many different varieties with different requirements on one tree and it don't work out as well. I've seen some fruit cocktails with citrus and, you know, we have planted a few of them. And what, what I've noticed that has happened in a lot of cases is that the most dominant variety is gonna take over and pretty soon the others will basically disappear. As for the, the, the what you're talking about, plum, the peach and um, nectarine, I am just hoping that you have varieties that um, don't require high chill hours. If you do, then you, you, you know, there, there's not much to be able to do. Um, How can you tell when a gra grapefruit is ready to be picked? Some, Some of the lemons on her tree are ugly with bumps and spots and grow large. And they, and they just don't look good. It happened last year and again this year. What caused Okay, we have two questions that, that just came in. One is um, the bumps on, on, the, uh, on the lemon. And I think somebody asked, how do you know when grapefruits are to be harvested? Was that, was that the question? Question? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's take the grapefruit first. Grapefruits can stay on the, on the tree for a long, long time. I have, seen, I have seen grapefruits that have stayed on the tree until the next crop came around and was almost the same size as the, the, the crop that was going. So you don't have to be in a hurry to pick those. That stays stayed on the tree until the seeds start growing inside of them. So yeah, it, you don't want to go that far but you can keep your grapefruit for a, for a real long time. They will stay on the tree for a long time. Okay. But once it starts turning, um, you know, they're, they're yellow and um, usually December, January, they're about, your, most, most of your grapefruits around here are, are ready to be harvested. Hope that answered that question. The one for the bumps on the lemons, 
a lot of times the, the, the bumps and the lemons uh, are a lot of different citrus for that matter is caused by what is known as citrus scab. Um, it's, a, it's a fungal disease. It does not affect the inside of the fruit. So the fruit's still edible. But if you were a commercial grower and trying to sell those fruit, nobody would buy them because they are not very good looking. Um, so I guess your question would be then, well, what can I do about them? Uh, again, this is one of those things where you might have a Sorry, high interest in one year and the following year you don't. And so usually, you can do some things like rake up yeah. all the leaves that are fallen and get rid of those, any fruits that are fallen, get rid of those. And um, try not to water overhead onto the leaves. Um, you could do those kind of stuff. But as far as using any kind of uh, chemical control, you probably use uh, maybe a uh, Cup of fungicide, but you're gonna have to do a lot of work. You're gonna have to start spraying from early, early, early. And um, the amount of work that you're gonna have to do to try and protect those, in my opinion, it's not worth it if you're a homeowner. If you're a commercial grower, yes, you'll have to do it. So we can just have them look bad and still eat them? Just have them look bad and eat them. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> How long before a uh, young Meyer lemon starts to bear? A lot of times I've seen some Meyer lemon that came out of the nursery with fruits on them. So that's not uncommon. It's not, it's not um, an acceptable practice to leave the fruit on a tree that has been recently planted. I always suggest that you take the fruit off the first year or in some cases the first couple of years. So, um, and especially um, Meyer lemon, a lot of Meyer lemon are not grafted. They are grown from cutting. So this is why they tend to behave like bush. They, they're not growing up like a tree. So they, they will produce, they, they should produce very early, probably, I would say in a, in a couple of years, two to three years you should start What's the best time to fertilize twice a year? I would start fertilizing um, like in early, early spring because citrus, uh, well, I'm thinking citrus, I don't know why, but if you're, if you're going to fertilize, fertilize in early spring when, you know, trees starting to, they're waking up from winter. They're, they're, you know, some are actually flowering. So this is the time when you need to, you know, get some fertilizer on them. Also remember, anytime you put out fertilizer, make sure you water the tree because fertilizer and water go hand in hand. You could do the second um, uh, application of fertilizer maybe in another month from there. So I know some folks who will do um, like in uh, uh, say February, March, you know, April. The only thing I would say, don't fertilize your trees in, in the fall, because then you're going to be stimulating them to start, you know, growing, and then you could have, you know, a disappointment come winter. If you're fertilizing three times a year, is February, May, and August good times? That's good. How do you prevent raccoons from eating all the satsumas? Can you find out? Let me know. <laughs> I, I had, um, uh, uh, I ha since we're not able to do a lot of site visits, we get a lot of emails and folks would send um, pictures. And just this past week, I had a picture from, you know, this gentleman sends in and says that the, his citrus was, was rotting on the tree before he could get to him and I said, well, send me a picture. He sent me the picture and I could see it was um, damaged by, by a raccoon. 
you know, and, um, you know, because he didn't think he would just go out in, you know, after a few days and he sees this and he thinks that it was the, the, the fruit was rotten. So then he, he, he sends me an email and he says, oh, they start on the other tree now. So they have finished that. The good thing about raccoons is that they are not as voracious as some of the other nuisance wildlife. So they're not the ones who are going to come in and eat all your fruit in one night. They're not that type. They, they, they're, they're not real greedy. <laughs> Squirrels are very greedy. Yes. Um, possums like persimmons too. Yes, they, they, they will. They will get to them. Can you graft the Satsuba branch onto a sour orange tree? She has a sour orange tree that's got worthless fruit. You can use those sour oranges to help to make marmalade. The answer to that question is yes, because you know, but I will tell you this much. They don't, we don't recommend that homeowners do much mm -hmm. grafting because then, you know, they will start going out getting cuttings from Come just on, about anywhere and everywhere. And before you know it, they would probably bring disease um, um, trees into, into the state. So this is why only, only a few nurseries are certified to, to um, produce right. citrus trees. So it's, it, you know, we, we, we try not to encourage that. And I'm gonna tell you this much, for the effort that you're gonna put in to try and graph it onto the sorry, unless you wanna do it for, for the fun of it, you would be better served buying a new tree. Julie wants to know what is fire blight and the For pears. Pears, you, you ever notice your pear trees, you see the tip, the tip of the branches just turn black and, and it dies back. Sometimes the leaves start turning black and then sometimes the entire branch start turning back. So that's fire blight. And what you have to do, you have to go in and cut that back, cut that back into some green wood. So you go beyond the dried up portion and cut that off. You just don't want the disease to spread further into the tree. If a mulberry or other fruit tree is already way too tall, will it damage or kill it to oh, chop the trunk tall, off now at 10 feet? No. When is it too big to, no. to prune and cut out that central leader? No. No. no, it would not be too, it would not be too big. i tell you this, it's something that I did. I had a fig tree that had gotten to about 10, 12 feet tall. And that wasn't too tall, but it was, it was too tall. Uh, the main problem was that the birds and the squirrels were the ones feeding on it. And I wasn't getting any at all. So I took my chainsaw to it and I cut it back. And sure, the, the following year, I got no fruit at all. But after that, I start pruning those, those branches and I kept it under control. So uh, um, like your mulberry, yeah, they're, they're very forgiving. So if you were to you know, really do a hard prune on it, um, yeah, you could, you, 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 you could still um, get it back to, to where you want it. But you, might not, but you might not get any fruit for a couple of years. Bullbark has two fig trees five feet apart. One is not growing an Ouch. inch bigger and the other is growing very fast and is now huge. They both had fruit on them when they were purchased, but after a year and a half, not one single fruit. Five feet apart is a little bit too close. So you have to probably decide and uh, you know, um, moving move one. And I would say probably move the smaller. Um, that's not gonna do it. If, if you have a fig tree that hasn't produced and it was fruiting at the time of purchase, it tells me that you probably have it planted out in the open and it probably got knocked back during winter. It regrow in spring and it get knocked back again in winter and it does that yo yo yo. So, you're gonna have to protect the small tree that, that you know those those tender growth because figs one of those that tend to want to start um, growing 
real early. So you, you've got to protect those tender growth um, in, the, in the early years. We had one down at the office uh, in Wakulla County. And that thing would just stay there year after year after year because nobody was, was, was trying to uh, protect it from the cold. It would grow maybe about two, three feet and then winter comes, kills it right back, it grows again. And that, that was what it did all this time. So you have to do some amount of cold protection and then you would probably get, get start getting some fruit. Once it becomes established, yeah, if it gets a little bit of cold damage, it would still, you know, then you can just prune that dead part off and it will still be okay. How far apart do you plant um, pineapple guava for a cross Um, Like okay. I said, I've seen pineapple guava that are grown. We down at the office in Wakulla County. We planted pineapple guava as a hedge around the, the, the building. And I mean, and they were just overlapping and everything, you know, not problem. And they, they have that tendency that will, they would overlap real, real quickly. They would actually start getting, getting real close. So um, I don't know if they require um, cross pollination. I think they are self fertile. I think they are. Do you recommend growing kumquats as a low maintenance tree? Kumquats. Kumquats is probably one of the your most cold hardy citrus that you could ever buy. And as far as lowest lowest maintenance. Um, uh, um, citrus that you you could you could buy. So yes, they they work real well. Um, the thing about it is that there are some varieties of kumquats that are not very sweet, and they are not so they are not very desired as a fresh fruit. And this is why you know people don't plant plant them that much. The mewa is a good for eating out of hand. Yeah. The nagami is not good for that, but it's good for preserves and jams. Uh, someone following up on the uh, pineapple guava, is there a minimum and maximum for planting them? How far apart? What do you recommend? We have ours planted 15 feet apart and um, they weren't overlapping any. So that's a good, I, I found that to be a good space. I have not seen many people who plant um, pineapple guava in large if they're planting it as a hedge. Because they do, they're very prolific now. They produce a lot of fruit. Can you give us an update on citrus canker for this area and the greening? Citrus canker, citrus, citrus greening. Okay. We have not had any case of citrus greening here in Leon County. There's a psyllid that, um, that transmit the disease and um, they found the psyllid in Franklin County. And, um, but the presence of the psyllid does not necessarily mean there's the presence of the disease. But so for right now, we do not, we do not have any, any, any known cases here as yet. Um, as for canker, I don't, I'm pretty sure it might be, you know, there might be a few cases here, but it's not, it's not widespread. The other thing is probably because we, we are just getting a few people who are starting to produce large amounts of citrus here in North Florida. I think over in Jefferson and in, in Jackson County, they are, um, they are actually in Jefferson and Jackson County, they, are, they do have some um, commercial, commercial um, plots. So we don't seem to be bothered with that as yet. Robin wants to know, can she prune the top 
top of the orange tree that's four or five years old with clippers. It's growing too tall. De definitely, yes. If it's getting too tall, yeah, take it back. I, we, there was a, a citrus tree going right next to the door. Samson Hall on FAMU's campus. Famu's campus. This was a three-story building, three and that that orange that tree grew orange all tree around. All around. All so if you allow them, they will grow they very, will. very tall. Are there, any more, are there any more questions? Here's one. Gudrun wants to know, uh, can she lower the height of her loquat tree that's over 20 feet tall and take the chainsaw to it to bring it down lower? I don't really radical pruning on a loquat, so I I don't know how they would react. And um so I I am not I am not sure. And um the other thing too is that if you are in an area where it's shaded, your and the tree is competing for sunlight, it's gonna grow right back and become very tall again. So, you know that's something you have to make sure that you have under control. That it trees that I've seen that are in, you know, full sun, they don't grow very tall. They, 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 they the ones that I've seen that were tall are the ones that were competing either with buildings or other trees. So I am not sure about um, how radical you can get when pruning your low quad. Not sure. Adonius has his hand up. Uh, unmute your mic and ask your question. Um, Trevor? Yes. I have a tangerine tree that I've had for a long time and it is everything blooms around it. Everything and fruits away, but not that. I have not gotten one piece of fruit from it. What do I need to do? You bought that tangerine tree? What's that? It, it's a grafted tree, I presume? I don't know. Ah. I, I get all my trees from um, Esposito's and all the lemons are doing great and the grapefruit and the orange. Any of you this? So? For year, but I've had it for years and nothing. Okay. And it 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 is receiving enough sunlight in your Absolute, opinion. Yes, yes. Mm. And water. It's I mean it's in, it's with all the others. You know, I have like eight trees back there. And um mm. nothing. <laughs> I I don't know. I know we we had a, a punk and tangerine and it took a little while longer to produce than I know they take a longer time than your satsumas and some of the oranges and definitely longer than things like um, the tangible right. the grapefruits. They, I know they take, but you say your tree is about how many years old? Oh gosh, well, it was pretty tall when I got it. I think it was probably about five feet, six feet tall when I got it. And it's easily that a bit more now, but nothing. I mean, not even a blossom, nothing. That, that's, that's, and you don't remember? No, it's just says tangerine. And you're sure that it's not growing from the the rootstock? I don't think so. Okay. I just think if there's anything else I could do to it. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know. I I I I tell you a quick story about a tree that I have at home, which was mm -hmm. a mercot but it was grown from seed. And this is why I asked. And that tree took about 15 years before it produced the first fruit. <laughs> wow. So this is why I ask you this, but I tell you the, 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 the good side of that story was that it turned out to be one of the sweetest, sweetest, sweetest things sure. ever eaten. Mm. I had a pear tree for years a that grew uh, very, very tall and would never bear. And I had the uh, someone come out from the agriculture center finally, and we discovered that it was a. Yes. Uh, because, so I because, go, oh, why would you have an ornamental pear tree? But, <laughs> yes, because they it's a rootstock. I see. So the 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 the, the scion has has been um, damaged and gone. So all you're left with is a rootstock. 
I when tell I finally folks, cut it down. I tell folks a lot of time. It might sound radical, but um, it's sometimes better to go ahead and terminate some of these trees that are not producing and replace them with a, 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 a fruitful tree because you could you could get fruit in, in in about three years rather than sit and wait for something that has gone eight, 10 years and has not produced. Uh, uh, Robin, Robin wants to know uh, what she can do about her satsuma. Uh, the uh, leaves have turned yellow with green veins. You probably, more than likely, you have some um, nutrient deficiency going on right now with, with it. When you have um, yellow with green veins, it's probably an iron or a copper deficiency. It's a micronutrient deficiency, probably. Yeah, so um, wait until next year and fertilize probably, um, Audrey is saying use citrus stone because that has, is a complete fertilizer. It has both micro and macronutrients. Marion wants to know how she can get her 10 year old self-pollinating persimmon tree to bloom and bear fruit. How much, how much sun, sun does it get, Marion? Hi, um, it's right next to the house and it's taller than the roof. So at least the top part is getting all the sun it can want. What variety is it? Well, I don't is know. Is it a sago or a I fuyu? It a nursery. Um, it, it's not astringent. It's not astringent. And it's self pollinating. I'm wondering if I maybe, maybe got um, a stray that really was not self pollinating. I don't know. I had a fuyu and um, it took about eight years. And um, they, 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 you know, the, the nursery had warned me that it's gonna take a long time. So it's not uncommon for some of these to take eight years before they produce. And um, I think the ones we have at the office took about maybe five to six years before we, we got an A. But there are some varieties that will start producing the next year you put them in. Yeah. I Here. think it was a food group. I think the squirrels are going to eat anything from that tree before I get it anyway. So it's it's too tall and you probably need to cut it back? Well, but then it won't get the sun. It'll have shade from the house. So. Oh, and um, from what I've seen of the persimmons is that they are not very happy when they're in shaded areas. Yeah, but this is taller than my roof, so it has sun up there. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it's probably going to start producing soon then if it's taller than the roof. So how long do you give it? 20 years before you chop it down? I, I Like I said, we've had some that went eight years before they produced, but once they did start producing, they, they produced very well. Well, this is more than eight years. Okay. Gudrun wants to know, do you agree with Brandy from Just Fruits and Exotics that you can plant three citrus trees in one hole at different slants to conserve space? Yeah, uh, if, if you could do this, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, let's just for argument's sake say you're in an area where you only have limited, and I mean limited land space, but you want to have, you want to have the maximum amount of trees. Yeah, you're not gonna get as good a production having that, but you would get, a it's one of those things. Jean wants to know if, can you get avocados from the seeds you grow? Uh, avocado. All right, I'm going to tell you, give you the quick thing on avocado. Um, there were a few varieties that were, um, and I know, I think Esposito at one time used to do it. I know um, Just Fruits probably carried them one time, but there are a few ver um, that were being sold here. There was one called Mexicola. It's a real tiny fruit, but it, you're not going to go to Publix and buy an avocado and plant the seed 
and get that to fruit here in North Florida. That's not gonna happen because those varieties are not cold hardy to start with. And two, if you plant that seed, it's gonna take, it might take eight, 10 years in South or Central Florida. It might take you about 10 years before or more before you see a fruit. And there's also the possibility that the fruit that you get might not be true to type. So you bought that good fruit that you enjoyed. Now you plant the seed, you wait 10 years and only to find out it's not exactly the way it was. Your best bet is to, um, for those things, you buy a grafted tree and you call it for North Florida. For two reasons, not so much a cold, but there is a ambrosia beetle that is wreaking havoc on the av avocado industry. I have gone out and seen a few trees that were growing around here in, in, in Tallahassee. And most of them have died and it wasn't from coal. So I have always said, well, let's do what we're good at. We're not good at avocado. Doesn't that same beetle go after sassafras? Yes. Oh, yes. Because they're, I, I think they're in the same family, so they, they will attack those. For watering new trees, do you suggest too deep watering per week or 10 minutes micro watering every day? If you can do the 10 minutes every day, that, that, that's just fine. You know? it, it, it would be just fine. It, it would be better than a deep, you know, two deep waterings per week, especially when we are in high humidity that all the trees are drying out. So if you have the time to do, you know, 10 minutes watering, that would be much better. Um, we have recorded this webinar uh, and we will have it posted probably by Monday afternoon on uh, YouTube. The people who do this uh, for us don't work weekends. That's why it won't be up yet. Um, we also have a poll we're gonna send out that we'd like you to take. And uh, after that, instead of giving away a coupon for something small, we have put the names of everyone who has attended today, although some people have already left, in a bowl. And I'm going to ask Trevor to draw one out. And the winner will get a three-gallon fruit tree, his or her choice of peach, pear, nectarine, or apple. So uh, if you'll do the poll and then we'll have the drawing, I'm gonna launch the poll now. Uh, these polls are in- No, oh, great, right. I'm, I'm muted. muted. Uh, we're, gonna do the drawing. we're gonna do the drawing for a free fruit tree as soon as the polling is done. So please answer the poll questions and we'll get Trevor to draw uh, a name out of the jar of everybody who attended today. Thanks. trees from seed in this area. I will address that mm -hmm. one. Okay. Poll. Questions today. Oh yeah. Luckily where there's really no limit on the time so we because we have a we have a business we have a, a paid life. We have time for one more question. Yes, I think we're we're gonna we, yeah we 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 will yeah. Okay, how you doing, Trevor? I'm um, just fine. I have a um, several several citrus trees on the property here, and I'm not exactly sure. I think they're Satsuma tangerines. Um, I have about eight of them, and two of the trees when they uh, fruit bear, uh, the peel is very very thick. And the fruit inside is like um, it's not as sweeter, and it's, it seems drier than. Is this a problem to be talking about waiting too long to uh, harvest the fruit, or is it like a nutrient deficiency that's causing no. this? Okay, the, one of the things that can cause you to have that cocky fruit is um, 
Yes, you could wait too long to harvest and they start drying out. The other one is if the fruit is produced out of season. You ever have, sometimes you have a, a orange tree and it bears and then it has another um, little crop, a uh, few on there. Those aren't usually gonna come out very, very corky. So that's the other um, reason. Um, I think the, the most important one is not leaving the fruit on too late. Um, Satsuma is probably one of your earliest maturing citrus. So you need to harvest those earlier. You know, I mean, things like your oranges, your grapes until probably January, February, and even um, sometimes even beyond that, but your satsumas by November, December, they are, they are ready to be harvested. Okay, so- I wanted to know about papaya trees. Uh, uh, for papayas, um, you're gonna need at least two years of growing in order to get fruit to ripen. You can plant, the seed and in a pot and in a big enough pot where you can protect it over winter and then the following year it probably gonna it probably will fruit then and um, it might take until the next year so you're gonna have to do some amount of cold protection but if you get lucky like we were last year where we have a map up against a building or some structure where it gets some warmth, it, 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 at the office, we had that papaya to ripen on the tree at the office because it was growing right next to the building and we had two, two winters that were very mild and it, it worked out. But papaya is very, very cold sensitive. Two more questions. Uh, Marianne says she has volunteer fruit trees from her compost, which have grown to maturity. If they have thorns, does that mean the fruit will be sour? Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily. Because in your, in your compost, you weren't eating sour orange. So it's probably not. But the fact that they grew from seed, that's why they are thorny. But it does not necessarily mean that the fruit's going to be sour. Because it's not just sour oranges that are thorny. Uh, Marie wants to know if there are any um, citrus, citrus in, or fruit trees you can plant in big pots that can produce fruit. Or do they have to be in good, the ground good one. to produce fruit? I had a, a Orlando Tangelo from many years growing in a pot and it worked. I don't, I didn't get a lot of fruit, but it, it worked. A lot of your limes, your limes will do well in pots because they don't get very big. So they, they can do, you know, relatively well in pots. Um, there are some oranges. I think there's a page orange that does, you could, you could put that in a pot and it would work. Just remember, you know, um, over the years, you're probably going to have to increase the size of the pot, go to a bigger pot, and, um, you know, you're, you're going to get less production than if it were in the ground. We have a kumquat in a big pot here in the other end of the Esposito shopping center. Uh, and it, the pot is probably three feet in diameter at the top. It's got to be a huge pot if you want to get decent production. Okay, Trevor, will uh, you kindly do the honors? Okay. And... Yeah, you can turn around so they can see what you're doing. And I am just going to reach in with my eyes closed and I'm going to pull one. And the name he pulled is Hassam Naruzi still here? So if he's not here... You have to pull somebody else. Yeah, I guess so. Let's check one more time.
No. Okay, okay, jog no. in, Trevor. That's on my dad and his here, actually. Oh, my Jerilyn Jackson, congratulations. Oh. All right. <laughs> Jerilyn Jackson. So uh, you can come by anytime. It's a three gallon pot, your choice of a plum, peach, nectarine, or apple. And we're going to take your picture with your tree for our newsletter as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I hope to have this posted soon. And uh, keep gardening. And thanks yes. again. And uh, we'll have Christmas trees next week, starting next week. And starting next Wednesday, we will be open till 9 p.m. We're currently open till 7. So y'all be good. Talk to you next week when Trevor will be back. Um, Just before... Before you you go, remember if you have any other, are you all hearing me? I, I presume. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you have any other questions, you can always call the extension office. And even though we are not in the office right now, they will get in touch with me, and then I, in turn, will get in touch with you. And if it's something that we can talk about over the phone or through pictures and all of that, we can do that. If not. I could actually even set up a, uh, an appointment with you and I could actually come. I am now allowed to come out and visit. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah.